Welcome to Drawfee, where we take dumb ideas and make even dumber drawings. I'm Nathan. I'm Jacob. I'm Julia. I'm Brennan. Guys, Brennan is here, cast member on uh, College Humor Originals, Dungeon Master Extraordinaire, host of Fantasy High on Dropout. Uh, Brennan's here to take us on a magical journey into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Holy moly, gang. I'm so super psyched. Uh, this is going to be such a hoot. I've been playing D&D since I was 10 years old. And uh, my God, we're really doing it today, huh? Yeah. We're doing the damn thing. We're Brennan. doing the dang thing. I've been playing D&D less long, but I like it a lot. Do you guys play? I've played D&D a few times, and I've enjoyed it every single time. The closest I've gotten is Draga. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, Dungeons and Dragons has been around for a long time, but it's experiencing a huge resurgence. We're in like a fun renaissance for D&D right now, uh, largely because uh, the newest edition, 5th edition, is just an incredibly designed edition of the game. Shout out to Mike Merles and the creative design team over at... Uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and also because of really popular D and D actual play shows like Critical Role and The Adventure Zone, and uh, uh, so it's a very exciting time, gang. And also because the Dungeons and Dragons world is much better than yeah. the reality we're currently in. <laughs> people people <laughs> love escapism. <laughs> we did it. I would rather fight a dragon than live a single <laughs> another day. Right. Well, yes. The escapism of fantasy is that evil is like collected into like an orb or a ring of power. <laughs> and you can very easily and, destroy it. And it, it can be destroyed. It's hard, but it can be, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's concentrated in a couple of destroyable objects, not disparate and smoky and hazy throughout like the hearts of your neighbors and fellow human <laughs> beings. So that's that's fun. That sort of brings us to our, our topic for today, because Brennan, you have some classic D and D villains that you are going to describe for us, and we're going to try and draw and represent via drawing, and we're probably going to get them a hundred percent right, like we always do on Drawfee. Always. We're going to start today with some D and D villains. These are classic villains from the canon and lore. So, talking a little bit about, uh, I think maybe the greatest villain of D&D lore. Have you guys ever heard the name Vecna? I have heard of Vecna. I knew Vecna as a, a, a deity in third edition. Yeah, well, if you let a villain scamper around and do their villain <coughs> things too long, they often become a deity. So woe betide the would-be adventurers to fucking get on the ball and do your damn thing. <laughs> because otherwise your homeboy is going to fucking turn into a god, which is what happened with Vecna. Vecna began life as a mortal wizard, transitioned into becoming becoming a lich, which is a powerful undead spellcaster, and then eventually ascended to deityhood. Uh, Vecna also was the final and greatest evil within the world of the first campaign of Critical Role. Vecna has poked his uh, dumb, rotting head into a lot of campaigns over the years. Real asshole. He's most well known by the symbols of his evil and divinity, which are his uh, severed eye and hand. So is he just like holding those? Like he's just hanging out with his like severed eye in hand. He's like, oh, I didn't want to leave him somewhere in case I'm like idiot. Brought him along. In case some idiot found him. So I'm just going to bring him with me. <laughs> <laughs> they are not, a t I'm not going to put them back on, but I am going to just Even carry though I am them. a god. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I think, always trying to get his eye and hand back, which is, I think, one of the most relatable things about Vecna. Yeah. <laughs> I, you yeah. know, he may be evil, but him trying to get his body parts back, that just, th those numbers crunch for me. That makes sense. So does that mean he still has, he still has one eye just like sort of in there? I'm trolling the Wikipedia page on it right now. At his empire's height, Vecna was betrayed and destroyed by his most trusted lieutenant, a vampire called Kaz the Bloody Handed, using a magical sword that Vecna himself had crafted for him. Yo, you fucked up your boss with a gift he gave you? That's... <laughs> That's unkind. <laughs> That's like the next level of returning like yeah. a coffee maker your coworker gave you <laughs> for Secret Santa. I'm also reading something now. This is great because I a lot of this D and D lore I osmosed as a little itty bitty like twelve year old. What I'm reading now in the Wikipedia article is it is not that Vecna lost his eye and hand, but that those were the parts that survived the battle with Kaz. Which effectively means that he didn't have his hand and eye cut off. He had everything else but his eye and hand <laughs> cut off, which is 
logistically hard to understand. I'm drawing this like lich wizard guy. Yeah, he said rotting head. Rotting head. One eye, one hand. Or maybe he has like six bajillion hands and only one of them got cut off. You never know. Yeah, we don't know. So I think he's sort but of- he was immortal, so. Yes, this looks like, what this looks like right now is Vecna explaining to somebody, hey, I'm still here. I just lost my hand and eye. I'm still very much here. And then repeating to him, no, I think that only your eye and hand survived. And him saying, that doesn't make any fucking sense. No, I'm what, right here. No, I'm talking to you, though. If all that's is the left thing. is an eye and hand, you don't say those things survived. You say the, it all died. <laughs> it all died. Those are gone. I'm desperately trying to get them back. Even a human being can survive losing a hand and an eye. I am a full lich borderline deity, please understand that I'm very much still here and scary. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan, is this his, is his own hand and eye? They're huge. Yeah, they're they're trying to get away. They're like, no, nah, dude, we're good. We're good over here. We're actually fine. Uh, we're actually we're actually good uh, on our own, if you don't mind. <laughs> I miss you so much, please. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> You are my favorite hand and eye, please. <laughs> oh my god. I love it. Well, they do they are possessed with some like fiendish intelligence. And there's this weird thing that I think mostly survives from the saga of the one ring in Middle Earth, which is like, oh, these artifacts are desperately trying to get back to their owner. I think it's a much more compelling narrative if the hand and eye have dreams and ambitions of their own, right? Why I got to <laughs> yeah. get back to this dumbass lich? He clearly didn't value me enough or he would never have let us get cut off in the first place. We're going to go, we're going to go fuck. What, what would a hand and eye do in their wildest dreams? Travel, just like anything that doesn't involve <laughs> being attached to a rotting corpse, you know? Yeah, they're just listening to Thank You Next by Ariana Grande, <laughs> yeah. just like off on their own. They're like, no. Can they hear, really? Yeah. That's like one of the few senses oh, they don't yeah, have. Yeah, I guess they they can just sign. They're watching the lyric video. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, buddy movie between the hand and eye of Vecna learning to work together and get along. It's called hand-eye coordination. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Just them being like, you have ne- you could never see what I've seen. Of course I can't. I'm a hand. And then it cuts into, you know, climbing up on Salisbury Hill. And then you <laughs> see them. <laughs> Just because I can't see doesn't mean I can't feel. <laughs> in fact, specifically feeling is one of the things I do the best. There are more nerve endings in your hand than almost any other place on your body. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is the movie poster for hand-eye coordination, uh, a Vecna story. This is like them going out on their own, and Vecna has to learn to let them go. Yeah, you know, he learns that if you love something, you have to kind of let it <laughs> let it do its own thing. Sometimes this is beautiful, and I think for all of our our friends out there who are maybe thinking about running their own games and being dungeon masters in their own right, this is a great example of building villains. Right, a villain's job in a campaign is to present an opposing force to the heroes, but also to have ambitions of their own, right? Because villains can't exist purely in opposition to your protagonists. They need to have, you know, dreams and wishes. So building a villain like Vecna, who aside from what the PCs are up to, just has got to get these organs back. That's a really... (laughs) That's a compelling story for your bad guy, right? He will burn countless worlds to the ground to just get this stuff, just to be able to like read a book or like probably Vecna's softball league. He used to be the pinch hitter and now he can't see that ball coming. He's got he's got no depth perception. And I am going to give him a baseball hat just for, just yeah. for that. A little characterization. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Please, I need you for the big game. <laughs> Don't you understand? I'm the I'm the slugger on the team. I'm hitting dingers left and right most of the time. Now I can't see the pitch coming in, and even if I could, I'm only swinging with one hand. Help me, please. <laughs> All right, Should we look I'm, him up. Yeah, I'm gonna look up uh, what Vecna looks like. There's our bad bad boy. Look at him oh, go. Oh man. Look at his collar. That's so rad. It looks like yeah, he he's got a blue hand and eye. In, to replace them. I love that on his book, the cover of it is a hand with an eye. Like clearly he wrote that <laughs> he's, book. He's, no, he's looking he's at reading. memories <laughs> he's of his not, hand. Yeah, it's like a photo, it's a photo album. album. <laughs> he's not over it at all. <laughs> I mean like how bad does it suck? Look, 
I don't, I'm not a fan of any of the evil deities, right? Being evil is bad. You can put me on the record as saying that. <laughs> Being evil is bad, Brendan Mulligan, 2018. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. You cannot knock the hustle of a mortal who becomes a deity. Like, just the socialist in me approves of that pushing up from the bottom, like, no gods, no masters, we're going to do this thing. And then to do all that fucking hustling to achieve divinity, and then your symbol is a symbol of the time you got punked the hardest, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely eat shit, Vecna. <laughs> oh, so good. Jacob, do you want to draw a villain? Yes, I absolutely do. All right, Brendan, I'm ready, man. Lay it on me. Okay, cool. I'm going to talk about the Lady of Pain for a second. So, Lady, the Lady of, of pain. pain. What a dope name. The Lady of Pain. She fucking rules. The Lady of Pain is the uh, the mistress of the city of Sigil. Sigil is the city of doors. It exists in the outer planes, which th- they are afterlives, but they are also just these places of ideological platonic truth. Like they they are assigned alignments. So like oh, okay, cool. So cool, like cool. Mount Celestia is the lawful good paradise, right? Then you have like the nine hells, which is lawful evil. The abyss is chaotic evil, where like all the demons live and shit. Uh, Arborea is chaotic good heaven. So that's like where the elven pantheon is and stuff like that. Sigil is this giant city Um, which is on the inside of a torus. So basically, in an infinite plane committed to pure neutrality, there is an infinitely tall spire of rock, and floating above that is a sideways stone donut. And on the inside (laughs) of that donut, on the inside of that donut... uh, uh, is a city, so that because it's on the inside of the donut, it is facing itself going around in a circle, right? That's so, rad. That's it, fucking, that's just rad. It's facing itself going around in a circle. Okay, got it. So the Lady of Pain is this completely silent woman. Is she a mortal? Is she a deity? We actually don't know. We know that she can prevent gods from coming into her city. And she's got a bunch of swords coming out of her head. Um, <laughs> swords coming out of her head? Sorry, oh my big God. detail. So she's got a ton of blades coming out of her head. Wait, like they're sticking into her head or they're coming out? Uh, I believe they're coming out. They're, so it's like she's got this weird crown of swords. So like nobody knows what her fucking deal is. She just rules over Sigil. So Sigil is this city that has the highest concentration of portals in the multiverse, right? So outer planar beings, inner planar beings, uh, creatures from the prime material plane. Sigil is basically magic New York City if it existed in an afterlife that was devoted to true neutrality. Then it would be a a bagel, not a donut. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'm so sorry. So yeah, it exists on the inside of a giant everything bagel uh, with all the buildings pointed uh, at itself. And the Lady of Pain, we know that she allows devils and angels into her city as long as they don't bring their wars here. So Sigil's kind of like a Casablanca-esque place where it's like the fight's not happening here, but opposing sides of all these armies can come to this weird neutral ground to get up to shenanigans, right? And she won't let gods come into the city. If you try and worship her, she removes you from existence. Like that's the one rule that she has. We don't know why, but a lot of people try and worship her because she's one of the most powerful beings in the multiverse and she's just like very not into it. Uh, and it's she not- She hates tryhards. <laughs> <laughs> Like wow, embarrassing. Just auto banned. Just gonna remove you from existence. Yeah. She literally mm-hmm. does auto ban people in the cosmology of D and D. It's called the mazes, and it's just an <laughs> extra planar space that if you're like, if you like, light a candle in front of a picture of her, and you're like, I know I'm not supposed to, but I want to say a prayer to you. Ah! You just get flung into this extra planar space, uh, where you, I guess, never come back from. Uh, wow, sucks. That is awesome. <laughs> now, Brennan, this is this is what I was afraid of would happen because this is something that happens when I watch Fantasy High is I just start getting distracted thinking like I just get inspired with all of these ideas to try and come up with now my own D&D adventure. 
and I and I lose the thread, and then I like come back in, and they're fighting some corn monsters or something. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. I was thinking about my D and D adventure, <laughs> and this is now. Now I'm just thinking about a fucking bagel city of doors <laughs> with a with a lady of pain in charge of everything, where like devils and angels can come hang out, but like there there's clearly some like animosity, but they know they can't start shit because they'll get auto banned. <laughs> and that's all I want to think about for the next for the next day or so. Yeah, it's incredibly cool. The people, yeah, the fuck, the people writing this are so creative. I love that shit. Planescape was the coolest shit. I think she just kind of got like a no nonsense sort of like, yeah. oh god. I do like this face a lot. This this shit again that I have to deal with. <laughs> These people trying to worship me. Because like she said she's like silent, right? Like she doesn't speak. She's totally silent. So here's another wild thing. If you like world building, she doesn't talk, right? Her servants, because she is sort of omnipotent and doesn't need anyone to really kind of help her out. Her servants are these creatures called Dabas, which are weird kind of like if you had like an eight foot tall gray who from Whoville, they kind of their faces kind of look like... <laughs> Who's? Uh, I don't but, want that at all, Brennan. But their but their hairs they have like white troll hair, like the little gem belly trolls. But their hair kind of like moves around like they're underwater. Here's the thing: they're supposed to be her like servants and like logistical people. They also don't talk. <laughs> they also don't speak, but they speak by having weird little flickering white runes appear above their head. So effectively. They are like communicating in web dings because they're it's like they they I I don't I think it's like they communicate in a language that doesn't exist anywhere else to each other. So they're basically like in a chat room with each other broadcasting their internal chat state. And they, I guess, like, I don't know, you know, go get bagels and coffee for the Lady of Pain out in the city. Oh, this drawing rules. She looks extremely cool. They're just every so often they'll just all erupt. In, in laughter because they all they shared like a, a real funny a real funny meme on their yeah what's what's their, like a web ding I don't their... remember any web dings but I want her to be like levitating one here like she's giving an order <laughs> yeah it's just like well probably now in the year 2018 they've probably updated the campaign setting so now it's a lot of like emojis and memes and stuff so there's oh probably, yeah sure yeah there's like some weird like like a weird laughing devil or something or some angel making a dumb face and that's their version of LOL. <laughs> yeah, she's just gonna have like the uh, like the crying laughing. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, who did this? <laughs> like this is her. <laughs> Lamau, who did this? But she can't like express that emotion, but no, she just saw something she really just holds funny. It up. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to see what these what these giant who's look like. The the Dabas are very, very cool. They're also very fun because it's like we all understand like devils and angels and like what their job is in the cosmos of like protecting the good, tempting, you know, innocent souls. Davos are like, no, I'm comparable to an angel, but instead of this cosmic battle between good and evil, I just like hang out and do chores. And it's very <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'm not mad about it. Oh, is this the is this the bagel? Yeah, this is just a big bagel. Oh boy. Uh that represents her, you know, whole like city. So Planescape was a second edition campaign setting. And they have reference to Sigil in 5e and in 3.5 as well. But oh man, if they ever released a Sigil handbook, like or a full Planescape for fifth edition. It's just such a fun setting because you end up in these adventures where you're like, you're just like a bunch of mercenaries, but you're like, yeah, we have to go to hell for work. Like, that's just our life. We're multiplanar beings. Going to hell is very normal. Going to heaven is very normal. We just got shit to do. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I think this is like, her. Oh, I don't can't, know. <laughs> can't hang out today. Have to go to hell for work. <laughs> I'm on location. <laughs> Uh, yeah, should we like look and see what her actual depiction is? So this is the Lady of Pain. The Lady of Pain. The Lady of Pain. Dope. Oh, that's cooler than what I did. Dang, that's rad. <laughs> <laughs> way spikier than I thought. 
She's the real deal. Uh, Julia, do you want to hop in and, and finish this thing off? I want to be in there. All right, Brennan, hit me with a villain. I'm going to go uh, a little bit biographical on this one, and I'm going to go to the very first villain I used in a D&D campaign. I ran this campaign from when I was 12 to when I was 17. The very first villain I used in the campaign was Wolf. She is the goddess of the drow, the spider queen of the dark elves. So in the elven pantheon, right, you have high elves and wood elves and uh, aquatic elves. So the dark elves, the drow, are the subterranean race who worship this spider goddess. Uh, she is most often depicted as being in the form of a drider, which is basically an elf centaur. But the top half is drow. So they have this like subterranean, like onyx jet black skin with pure white hair. And below the waist, she is a giant monstrous spider. So it's like nice. a, it's like an elf spider centaur. I remember the first time I saw a drider was in the 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 third edition monster manual and the picture they have for that it's just this drider looking so pleased with itself as it's like doing that that thing where the the spider wraps up its victim in the web and this this mostly encased person being wrapped up with the most horrific expression on their face <laughs> And, well, they can't be enjoying it. Yeah, but like the fact that they the the artist thought to leave that part open and just this person just in so much pain <laughs> and anguish, and I was like, dang, this game's cool. <laughs> Driders, which is the shape Lolth takes, are actually a, a species of monster. They're like clerics who fuck up their LSATs. So like <laughs> drow clerics as they're like their acolytes and then they're going to be inducted into the clergy. Like, yes, you will worship Lord, the spider queen. You must take this test. And if you pass, you will become one of the high members of drow society. If you fail, your legs will turn into spider butt and a <laughs> bunch of stuff will pop out and you will have to leave and you'll go out into some other cave and <laughs> just go live a separate spider life somewhere far away from us. Look to your left, look to your right. One of you will fail this test and get a horrible spider butt. <laughs> so I guess chew on that for a bit, yeah. asshole. <laughs> Which is what you will be literally if you fail this. We do not grade on a curve here, so <laughs> it's a pass fail. <laughs> so my mom, Elaine Lee, is actually a sci-fi fantasy author. She wrote this comic series called Starstruck. She's written a lot of really cool stuff. She has a there's a thing in a fantasy novel she's writing, which, you know, I hate to spoil it before it's come out or anything, but she wrote this awesome scene where a centaur from this like plains lands where these proud centaurs live goes to a human city for the first time, thinks they have seen a really hot centaur. They're like really attracted to the centaur that they can't see the front half of it. And there's this whole scene where it steps out as the first time the centaur sees this horse after just wanting to really fuck it based <laughs> on its butt alone. And then being like, no! And like going insane, like charging through this marketplace and having this whole existential crisis about seeing a hot horse butt that I'm surprised hasn't come up in fiction or media before. That would be really terrifying. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, that's gotta I guess, leave an impact yeah, do on Yeah, centaurs you? not know about just regular horses, I guess. Yeah, in that world, it was a total shock. And you go like, you know, it's it's like, that. It's like, okay, can I appreciate this horse butt knowing that instead of there being a beautiful torso and arms and head, there's this crazy, elongated, misshapen thing on the other side. Right, because if you've never seen a horse, like horses are weird looking on their own, but if you think that the front of a horse is supposed to be a full person's torso and head yeah and then instead you get this like fucked up long dog you just get you just get head it's just head it's just thick neck and weird long dog face yeah that's got to be soul crushingly uh awful you'd be like what happened to you it's just like oh no <laughs> oh my god it's terrifying Oh, this is looking great. Yeah, this is That's a, a this nice is really big bulbous spider butt you got there. Thank you. She's proud of it. Oh, she looks a little she shy is. with the hands. Aw. 
<laughs> she's about to ask someone on a date. It's like... I just imagine she's like twiddling them like a little spider's legs and they're like trying to get the web off of their leg when yeah, it gets yeah. stuck sometimes and they're just like, oh, God, come on. Because like, isn't, <laughs> isn't part of the deal with Drow, it's like they, they started worshiping spiders after they got exiled to the, to the underground. Like they had, they were just elves before and they, they forsook all their elven gods that had like forgotten them and they were like, I guess, I guess we worship spiders now. We gotta worship something. It's crazy to me in the D&D cosmology that most of these worlds have multiple subterranean civilizations because like uh, there's a bunch of different um how do you put it evil sub races of surface dwelling right. things so like <laughs> yeah if you go underground you you're evil is like yeah. basically the except deep mo- deep gnomes seem like they're 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 chill I wonder if they have like a a sense of like gentrification down there. Yeah. Of like, okay, so what? So you got banished, and now you're gonna come down and try to conquer the underdark. Yeah. Oh, now you you think you know what being evil's about? I've been evil this whole time. <laughs> 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 like, hey, come on, man! I am a full albino bug monster. <laughs> don't don't come down here and be like, oh, we got banished. Now the now caves are our thing. Fuck you. Right? Yeah. Uh, Don't come down here and be like, oh, now we're opening a craft beer bar down here in this neighborhood. <laughs> like, we don't like yeah. craft beer. We're horrible bugs. <laughs> Julia, this is rad. Is she, she's like a, what, is she's like a queen or something? What's her, what's her deal? She's like the queen of the drow. So she's, she was maybe like, yeah, have like a crown or, or uh, something else like that. I remember using her as the villain in this campaign because I had a ton of elves in my very first campaign. I think four, four of my PCs were elves. The PCs were Panweer Shazemni, uh, Hilaria Loman Meldor, um, <laughs> Sandra Lynn Galanadel. Whenever I've been tasked with naming a character for role play, I just like immediately want to make something that's just stupid. It's like my first oh, for instinct. Sure. Yeah. Because I, I guess I haven't been role-playing my whole life. I've been doing more making up dumb shit my whole life. Yes. <laughs> so that's my area of expertise. Well, I think what happens is, and I always, because listen, I'm a fucking goofball as well. But the thing I always say, especially when it comes to like naming characters, is that people will often sit down and they will name their character something goofy because they're sitting down to play D&D for the first time. So they're like... My name's like uh, my name is you know butt scratch tumble down, <laughs> and you're like, all right, man, cool. Here's what's gonna happen, and th- I, here's the thing: that's a f- hilarious name. Congrats. Yes. You're gonna. I get it. That's really funny. Seven years from now, when we're concluding this campaign, and you are like weeping, holding your lover's head in your arms as they pass away from this mortal plane. <laughs> They're gonna look. Up, they're gonna look up at you with blood coming out of their mouth, and they're gonna go, "I, I have always loved you, butt scratch." And you're gonna feel like a piece of shit. So, what I'm saying is, you've got to invest now. You've got to commit right now. Oh, that's so funny, though. Yeah. <laughs> No, now I want to name all my characters Butt Scratch Tumble Down. Yeah, you've had the opposite impact on. Yeah, me. no, that sounds that sounds really funny. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you know, like just through this episode of Drawfee, how many characters you've launched into other D and D campaigns around the world. Name Butt Scratch, Name Butt Scratch Tumble, Tumble Down. down. Yeah. yeah, like that's absolutely that's, happening. That's on you. That's one hundred percent on you. Fault. So uh, <laughs> you just have to live with that. Go ahead and tweet at Brett and LM all of your butt scratch tumble downs. Yeah, take a screenshot of your character sheet. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I will only accept uh, art of butt scratch tumble down in the most serious, heroic, heartfelt, touching moment. Yes. Right? I, I want to see the seven years into the campaign moment where butt scratch has this catharsis yeah. and we see their their true moment of pain and loss and rebirth. That's what I want. Absolutely. They meet their <laughs> God and their God forsakes them. <laughs> Cast them out. <laughs> oh my God, I love it. Uh, Julia, this rules. <laughs> this She's done. This fucking rules. This oh rules, my you did God. great. This is so awesome. What's this lady's name? Lolf. 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 
Oh, damn. Oh. All right, let's see what that maybe. be. Ooh. Oh, damn, she has a cool headdress there. That's cool. That's extremely rad. D&D is good is the moral of this episode. Yeah. And you guys should watch Fantasy High on Dropout because Hell yeah. uh, you get to you get to hear Brennan do all the voices. Yeah. Just so many. Oh, the voices are so impressive. If you if you can <laughs> think of a voice that a character might have, Brennan does it and it's <laughs> glorious. All the voices I do because I've had the privilege and honor of doing voices for Cartoon Hell also available on Drop. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. <laughs> and all of that is from doing D and D. Like it's not let's not put the you know, the cart before the horse. I started doing voices because it made it easier to transition between NPCs in sure. games of D and D. Brennan, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the episode and uh, just filling me with with so much desire to play more D anD D, which is uh, what you guys will feel every time you watch Fantasy High. Hell yeah, guys! Thank you. This is an absolute hoot. I love it. Uh, Drawfy rules. This was rad. I love D anD D. Thank you for having me on this show. Yeah, and uh, you guys should sign up for Dropout. There's a link in the description. You can watch Cartoon Hell. You can watch Fantasy High. You can read the Ladies Book Club comic, which is sort of like a D anD D inspired as well. It's almost. It's it's almost it's almost another D and D. I don't we usually apologize at the end of the episodes, but I don't I think we did a good job. I think we did a good job. The I think only thing I'm a... sorry for is if you can't watch Fantasy High. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> yeah. That you watch this instead of watching Fantasy High. <laughs> uh so I'll still say uh we're sorry. We're sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs>